Dear students, today I uh, will begin a lecture on Karl Popper's science as falsification. This is one of the significant uh, philosophical theories of 20th century. In fact, Karl Popper happens to be one of the uh, greatest philosophers of science of 20th century. Now, let us have a little understanding about his background so that we can make sense of his theory in a much better way. Now, uh, if we look at the blackboard, we will see that he is an Austrian philosopher. He was born in Vienna. What is his time period? 1902 to 1994. That means his active life, his active academic life corresponded with, coincided with significant social, economic, political, historical changes in the 20th century. And he was also responding to that. He was not only a philosopher of science, he was also a political scientist. He was also a social philosopher. He has also written books in the field of uh, social philosophy. Now, these are some of the uh, landmarks book, landmark books written by Karl Popper. Uh, for instance, poverty of historicism and open society and its enemies fall into the domain of social philosophy, political science, social sciences. What does, where do, what does he do there? In, in open society and its enemies, he critiques the totalitarian states. I told you that his time period coincided with major political upheavals in uh, Europe. He was a Jewish. His parents were Jewish. Hence, uh, when Germany attached uh, Austria to its empire during the Nazi era, he feared for his life. And he was also looking for uh, academic opportunities outside Europe. And he landed a job at University of Canterbury College at Christchurch. Now that is where, when he, this is a time of Second World War and he was teaching at University of Canterbury College, uh, Christchurch. And that is where he wrote his book, Open Society and Its Enemies. He was a strong proponent of liberal democracy and he felt that social criticism is a perfect way to ensure liberal democracy. So it was a staunch, he, he uh, uh, launched a staunch criticism of totalitarian states, dictatorships. And he felt that open society is only possible if there is liberal democracy. Poverty of historicism is about a criticism of Marxian uh, theory of historical materialism. Logic of scientific discovery is his uh, contribution, his treatise in the philosophy of science. Now, interestingly, Popper was born in Vienna 
which was the intellectual capital of Europe in the early part of 20th century. So he came in contact with many of the intellectuals. In fact, at home, he had an intellectual. His father was a lawyer and was a bibliophile. A bibliophile, somebody who loves books, somebody who is fond of books, somebody who keeps books. And his father had an enviable collection of 12,000 to 14,000 books. So his, he was exposed to books, uh, different knowledge claims right from his childhood. And that had a significant influence on his intellectual development. By 1919, he became enamored by, became influenced by Marxism. In fact, he uh, also enlisted himself as a member of Social Democratic Workers Union of Austria. But soon, he became disenchanted with Marxism. He felt that it is, Marxism is not a science. It is it is a pseudoscience and this idea of science, pseudoscience, what is science, this is what we are going to look at in this lecture through his uh, uh, discussion on science as falsification. Now, a uh, little more background is required to understand this. In 1919 was the first time when uh, Albert Einstein's uh, general theory of relativity was empirically substantiated, was empirically proved with evidence, concrete evidence. That is through Eddington light experiment. Now, we, all of us know that Einstein proposed gravitational theory, right? So, according to the theory of gravitation, the light get, gets attracted by solid bodies, heavier bodies. Now, his proposition was that the stars, distant stars who are closer to the sun, when the light from those stars come to earth, they come from a uh, direction, in such a direction that it appears as if his, uh, the star's original position has shifted because its light gets attracted by the gravitational force of sun. Now, how do you prove this? You cannot prove that, uh, you cannot observe stars in daylight. At night, uh, is difficult to 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 is impossible to measure the distance between the stars and the sun. What do you do? In 1999, Eddington experiment uh, was conducted where a very powerful camera was used to capture sun during a solar eclipse. So what was done was that. The sun was captured during solar eclipse and the distance from star to sun could be measured later on and the same star was captured at night, same constellation of stars were captured at night. So this is the first time it, it could be proved that this theory of gravitation is true because one could, uh, based on this photographs one, and the calculations, subsequent cal calculations. Uh, one could come to the conclusion that the star's original position appears shifted because it uh, lights get attracted by sun. Now, it has a, this this entire phenomenon had a deep influence on Karl Popper. I told you that by then he was already a Marxist, but soon he became disillusioned with Marxism. He also was working with Alfred Adler 
one of the prominent psychologist of that era who was in Vienna. Vienna was also uh, 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 the epicenter of social science, psychological sciences, natural sciences. So, he came in contact with many of these intellectuals. Now, he was working with uh, Alfred Adler as a volunteer. He was a student volunteer who was helping Alfred Adler in his social work experiments on young children in the working class neighborhood of, of Vienna. He was working in a social guidance clinic. Now, Adler had a theory that is theory of inferiority complex. And he could explain every psychological phenomenon through uh, the theory of inferiority complex. One day, Ad, uh, Popper, who was working with Adler, he brought a, a child whom he felt his case study does not exactly fall into the domain of inferiority complex of Adler. He felt that this is uh, not Adlerian. So, when he uh, discussed this with Adler, Adler said that, well, I can always explain it. It can always be explained, interpreted in the light of my theory of inferiority complex. Now, that surprised Karl Popper. He said, how is that? Adler said, that is because of my thousand fold experience. Then Popov said, then this must be your thousand fold plus one experience. It was a comment, but this what he actually meant was very simple. He said that in case of Adler, So, uh, to restart the discussion of uh, Popper and Adler, Adler who was working on uh, working class children as part of his psychological experiments, he was being helped by Karl Popper who was working as a volunteer and Alfred Adler had, a th uh, had developed a theory of infinity complex to explain psychological phenomenon. One day, Papa brought a child whom he felt is not an Adlerian case. That is, his feeling, his case study, his story cannot be explained within 
the theory of inferiority complex propounded by Adler. But Adler said, yes, I can. Then when Popper asked how, then said, it's because of my thousandfold experience. Then Popper felt, said immediately, then this must be your thousandfold plus one experience. What he actually meant is that in case of Adler, all the previous observation may not be sounder than the current one, but it is being interpreted in the light of the new case, like for instance in this case. And it is considered as an additional confirmation. So he did not, he was not convinced about the logic that is being used by Adler to, to uh, substantiate his theory. Now this is an example of Adler, a personal experience of, of uh, Popper through Adler's theory of infinity complex which led him to believe that science has to have certain basic parameters to be considered as a science. To have a scientific, for, for a theory to have a scientific status, it has to have certain basic characteristics. And this theory does not constitute scientific theory. And I have already told you that he was already disillusioned with Marxism. And he felt that Marxian theory uh, is a pseudo scientific theory. I have already told you that he was very much influenced by the Eddington light experiment which formally officially substantiated the gravitational theory of Einstein. Now, uh, we already know that Karl Popper who was born in Vienna and uh, was born to an intellectual environment, was born in an intellectual environment, was absorbing all the new ideas of his era, of his time, right. And when he was uh, uh, looking for a job outside Europe in order to escape the Nazis, he found a job in New Zealand and that is when he wrote a book called Open Society and Its Enemies, which is a uh, uh, strong critic of the totalitarian states and uh, 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 he is a strong proponent of liberal democracy as a political system. Then after his time or tenure at New Zealand, he came and joined the London School of Economics just after the Second World War as a professor of logic and scientific method. And after three years, he moved to London University which, and joined there as a professor of logic and scientific method. And he retired in 1969. And in the meantime, he kept on publishing. He was a prolific writer, kept on publishing, made uh, new arguments, novel arguments, and became one of the most famous philosophers of science of 20th century. While uh, working in the post-war uh, uh, Europe, he developed his idea of falsification. And in fact, um, he published that and in that uh, publication he makes an argument that science should be uh, considered, any theory should be considered scientific if it can be falsified. So he was a, uh, he rejected empiricism and inductive methods. He questioned the contemporary science. His idea was that any theory which should be or which can be falsified, negated, rejected is a good science is a good theory. Now, to explain this further, I will make use of some of the, I uh, will uh, show some of the uh, statements on blackboard and we will see which statements are falsifiable, which statements are non-falsifiable.
Now look at the statements. No human lives forever. All humans live forever. Which one can you falsify? Can you falsify the first statement? No. But you can always falsify the second statement. That is, all humans live forever. How can you falsify it? By producing a dead human body. Right? By producing a, uh, by bringing a dead human being to the laboratory, you can always say that all humans live forever. You can falsify this. Now, if initially we st started looking at this statement that no human lives forever, which is not falsifiable, but we can always falsify the second statement that all humans are, uh, live forever by producing a dead human being, right? Now, let us look at another statement. Some swines are white. From there, we can always infer that all swans are white, right? But suppose Somebody says, but there are black swans fa found in Australia. What do you do? You have to change your statement. Because then this statement, all swans are white, it is easily falsifiable. Because you, can, you just have to produce a black swan to falsify the statement. So, once you have produced a black swan, the statement can also be restated as all swans are white except those found in Australia. Now, please look at this statement. All swans are white except those found in Australia. Can you falsify it? No. According to Popper, this is a bad scientific theory because it cannot be falsified. There exists a green swan. Can you falsify this st statement? No. According to Popper, this is again a unscientific theory. It is not a theory at all. Because what is wrong? What is wrong with this statement? According to Popper, there is no time space dimension given. We do not know where those green swans are found. We do not know what is the time period when these uh, green swans are found. So, we cannot falsify this statement. Hence, it does not constitute a sound scientific theory. Again, look at this statement. Can we falsify this? We cannot. There is, for every metal, there is a temperature at which it melts. You cannot falsify this statement. According to Popper, this is, this does not constitute a scientific theory. 
Now, Now his theory is quite simple. He says, if single ferrous metal is not affected by, is unaffected by magnetic field, it cannot be the case that all ferrous metals are affected by magnetic field. That is, one single instance is sufficient to prove, to disprove a theory, to falsify a theory. He was a strong proponent of falsification theory and that theory of falsification he used to demarcate between science and non-science, science and pseudoscience. For him, Einsteinian theory of gravitation uh, is scientific because it could be falsified. If Eddington experiment had gone wrong, if it had produced uh, results that was not in sync with Einstein's argument on uh, gravitation, then this theory would have been rejected, but this theory could have been falsified. Hence, any theory which has a high risk element to it, which is, uh, which can be easily falsifiable, which can be uh, rejected, any of its uh, uh, aspect, that for him constitutes a strong scientific theory. I told you about Adler and his theory of inferiority complex. He was not at all convinced with that argument that Adler gave that this is because of my thousand fold experience that I can prove that this is another uh, uh, case which falls directly under domain of my theory. And we have already explained the logic that the, the previous observation was uh, may, may not have been sounder than the current one, but it was being interpreted in the light of the uh, new case and it is all considered as a additional confirmation. So, he was not convinced about the logic that is uh, that was being employed there to prove or disprove a theory. So, he was concerned about this thing in science that is the problem of demarcation. His concern was to distinguish between science and non-science. How to distinguish 
science and pseudoscience. That's why he developed this uh, jargon, the problem of demarcation. Problem of demarcation is nothing, but for him, it is a ploy to demarcate science from non-science, science from pseudoscience. We'll look at in the next lecture how he goes about doing that. He developed certain principles of falsification through which he felt science can be any theory can be considered as scientific and he was uh, uh, he rejected empiricism he rejected verifiability for him falsifiability was the main criterion to decide to demarcate science from non-science which we will discuss further in the next lecture thank you